Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm uh, very pleased to, uh, so my name is Derek Peterson. I'm a historian from Michigan and a member of the Board of Directors of the ASA. Uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of my colleagues on the board to introduce this speaker for this evening's Hormone Lecture. The Hormone Lecture was established by the African Studies Association in 2013 with a generous grant from Hormu Telecom Somalia Incorporated. The lecture is meant to focus on leadership, development, and democracy in Africa, delivered every year by an African scholar at the ASA's annual meeting. Previous speakers have included some very interesting and luminous people, including South African political scientist Maxi Shulan, the Somali political economist yeah. Ahmed Samatar, and the Ghanaian scholar Tachwa Manu. This year's lecture is given by Professor Mahmoud Mamdani. Professor Mamdani, okay, you got, you got to no introduction to this audience, but I propose to give one very briefly nonetheless. He is the Herbert Lehmann Professor of Government and Professor okay. of Anthropology, African Studies, and Political Science the what? at Columbia University, where he spends about half the year. Uh, we are and still working. You guys are striking. Called Jeremiah or Kevin. Institute for Social Research in right. Uganda, where he spends the other half of the year. He's the author yes, and of then, 12 and then books have those best known the by ASA members for his book in 1996, Citizen and Subject, which won the Best Book Awards, <laughs> whatever we're going to call it, <laughs> of the African Studies Association in 1997, the award formerly known as First Commits. <laughs> uh, I haven't really thought that through. So, <laughs> This book has just this year been revised and republished by Vitz University Press and Princeton University Press, uh, which is a welcome thing, certainly. He's long been involved in the academic life of Uganda, the country of his childhood. He taught at McKenna between 1980 and 1993 and was the founding director of the Center for Basic Research there. Based on his long experience in Ugandan academic life, he authored the important book, Scholars in the Marketplace, the Dilemma of Neoliberal Reform at the Kennedy in 2007. In 2010, in June, he was made director of the McKennedy Institute of Social Research, and in the ensuing years, he built up the academic culture at MISER, as it's called, uh, creating a new PhD program in social science and recruiting really top-notch students. There's now several dozen doctoral students at MISER, and several scholars have, in the past year or two, completed their studies and defended excellent dissertations. The MISER doctoral students who I know uh, and who I've been able to work with are, without an exception, well-trained, thoughtful, insightful scholars. They're a collective tribute to the work that they themselves have done under Professor Mamdani's direction to encourage and foster graduate education in Uganda's leading university. Professor Mamdani's lecture today is entitled Decolonization and Higher Education, Perspectives Shaping the Postgraduate Program at the McKennedy Institute of Social Research. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mahmoud Mamdani. Thank you, Derek. Friends, uh, comrades, colleagues, maybe some others. <laughs> Soon after I returned to Makere in 2010, I became conscious of the fact that I didn't belong to many networks. Uh, since I had gone to school in the colonial period, when all schools were racialized, all my former schoolmates had left with the 1972 Asian expulsion, with the result that I had no network in Uganda of former schoolmates. Even more important, since I had been an undergraduate in the U.S. and not at McKellen, I did not have a local college network. My only network was of Dar es Salaam exiles. I've been in exile, 72 to 79, very active in exile politics, and we all came back together. 
I'd come to Makere in March 1972 as a teaching assistant while doing my research for my doctoral dissertation at Harvard. Expelled eight months later, I returned in 1979 when Amin was overthrown. I was employed by the World Council of Churches and seconded to the Church of Uganda as what was called a frontier intern in mission. My mission was to research the foreign relations of the Amin regime. I wrote a book on it called Imperialism and Fascism in Uganda, which was published by the World Council of Churches. Those days, everyone had to carry an ID card. I remember the perplexed look on many a policeman's face when they would look at my Church of Uganda ID card with my photo and my name, Mahmoud Mangani. The unspoken question was, what is this Muslim doing inside the church? I never answered it. I joined Makere the next year, 1980, and left a decade later in the aftermath of the 1991 strike when the World Bank began to restructure higher education in Uganda. The bank claimed huge success for its pioneering program at Makere, which it went on to introduce in one African university after another. I returned to research this claim in 2007 during the sabbatical leave at Columbia. The result was a book titled Scholars in the Marketplace. There are lots of seats in front. Please. People are standing in the back, if you want, to, to, to have a back, something to support your back. <laughs> Makerere, I realized, had been turned into a marketplace. Every activity had been commodified and had a price tag. Courses and programs, even departments, had to show that they were responding to a market demand. Otherwise, they were written off as so many bad investments. The Makerere reform was justified as a series of survival strategies. The Department of Geography issued a degree in tourism. The Institute of Linguistics trained bilingual secretaries. To attend a meeting, whether on the faculty board or the appointments board, even to invigilate an exam, an academic had to be paid a sitting or an invigilation allowance. The bank argued that higher education was a private good, and since its returns were individual, then individuals must pay for it in the form of market determined fees, whether or not these were affordable. With the admission of private students, numbers skyrocketed from 6,000 to over 40,000 in a decade and a half. The main staff were offered twice their normal salary if they taught the same classes in the evening as in the day program. Fees earned from private students were divided between departments and faculties and management. At the start of the reform, individual departments and faculties kept 90% of the fees and the central administration received 10%. Academics were happy with being paid higher salaries, except that they had no time, we had no time for research. Makerere began to resemble a glorified technical college, or at times even a secondary school. The only exception were the science faculties, which refused to introduce an evening program, saying they needed the evening, the afternoon, or laboratory work, and refused to admit more students. The World Bank went further, demanded and got a transfer of government subsidies from higher education to primary education. The result was the introduction of free primary education and alongside fees for higher education. But since an expansion of primary education required strong support from higher education institutions, by way of training of teachers and preparing the appropriate curriculum and textbooks, the resulting crises cut across both primary and higher education. At Makerere Institute of Social Research, MISR, the acronym is MISER. <laughs> I am the director of MISER. <laughs> when I say that to donors, they're very happy. 
<laughs> At Miser, research gave way to consultants. When Macquarie invited applicants for the post of executive director of Miser in 2010, I applied. In my interview, I said to the appointments board that I would begin by devising the mission of Miser to combine graduate teaching with research. We would not just host researchers, we would introduce a doctoral program to create a new generation of researchers. Now, it is easy to formulate and announce goals, declare your vision, far more difficult to implement. Where to begin? Did we begin armed with a blueprint, or were we prepared to improvise? In reality, we constantly moved back and forth, from one to the other. The fact is, you can only begin from where you are, and you can only draw lessons from where you've been. We began with a set of don'ts. It was easier to identify no-go areas than to charter a way forward. The first no-go area was area studies. I had spent 10 years in the US as a student at Pittsburgh, Fletcher, and Harvard, and another 10 teaching at Columbia. In the 10 years when I was a student, I had stayed away from area studies. I said to myself, I had not come to the US to gather more and latest facts about where I come from. Rather, I had come to study how to learn in other words, theory, method, and the world. So I turned to the disciplines. I had also spent three years in Cape Town as A.C. Jordan Professor of African Studies and Director of the Center for African Studies. The first thing I learned in South Africa was that the academy was racially divided in ways far more profound than just the definition of which color students could be admitted where. The more profound division was epistemological. The study of natives took place in interdisciplinary area studies institutes, such as the Center for African Studies, of which I was the new director. The study of non-natives took place in discipline-based departments. Theory and comparison were the preserve of departments. Area Studies Institute simply applied theory. Now, theory is born of comparison. Comparison is older than colonialism, but it matures to its fullest in the colonial period. The Greeks made modest comparisons, first between cities like Athens and Sparta. Later, they turned to larger contexts, Greece, Persia, Egypt. Then came Arabs and Berbers, the great Berber historian Ibn Khaldun and the Arab traveler Ibn Battuta compared the Mediterranean, the North African, and the West African worlds. Others compared Arabia and lands to the East, particularly India. But the most comprehensive comparative work was carried out during the European colonial period. With the European colonial project, classification became global. In the heyday of European expansionism, the 18th and the 19th centuries, European intellectuals, starting with Hegel, then Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Maine, and others, began comparing the European and the non-European worlds. Their central question was, what is so distinctive about the West? The production of knowledge begins with ordering phenomena. Comparing means classifying. Mapping. Durkheim looked to chemistry as the master classificatory science. Marx looked to biology and its most elementary unit of analysis, the cell phone. That's how it begins capital. The commodity form is the cell phone of capitalist society. Comparison requires a standard, the familiar, through which the not so familiar is understood, sometimes as not quite yet, at other times as an outright deviation. All ordering has a reference point. For those who did the classifying and ordering of everything around the world, the reference point was the West. 
the reality they knew and considered natural. The problem is unavoidable. Since we are part of that which we compare, how does one avoid the problem of being evaluative and subjective? In the words of the great Nigerian historian, Bala Usman, the problem is unavoidable. You can only be conscious of it and thus limit your claims. Sheldon Pollock, the great Sanskrit scholar, gives the example of Jesuit priests who went to China looking for religion. Non-Buddhist China has no scriptures, but plenty of ritual. But religion for Europeans had a particular definition. There could be no religion without sacred texts. So the Jesuits concluded that China had no religion. In later years, missionaries reached a similar conclusion in Africa, that it had no religion, only magic and superstition. To its practitioners, they gave the name witches and witch doctors. It is this knowledge producing and not just knowledge transmitting apparatus that was brought to the colonies during, starting in the 19th century. I'm talking about universities. We get the concept of a university from the pre-modern period. Specifically, the name comes from the European model of a corporation whose members were granted two freedoms. Freedom from conscription by the political power and the freedom to teach by the church. The modern university went through a number of changes, external and internal. Externally, it claimed to be independent of the church. But it was not independent of the state. It was the autonomous of the state. This autonomy is inscribed in faculty governance. The modern university has three clearly defined groups, students, faculty, administrators. Second is a fee-paying and degree-awarding institution. It authorizes knowledge. So that to be considered an economist, you need a degree in economics awarded by an accredited department in an accredited university. Finally, knowledge in this institution is disciplinary. Degrees are awarded in disciplines, and disciplinary gates are managed by discipline-based bodies. The prototype of this modern university was the University of Humboldt, created in the aftermath of Napoleon's conquest of Prussia in 1811. The defeat triggered a, social, a great social renewal in Germany, and it led, among others, to the emergence of a new kind of institutional learning one supported by the state and mandated to produce the human resource considered necessary for this renewal. It is this basic model of the university that spread from Germany to other parts of Europe, the United States, and elsewhere. Except for two differences. When it came to independent countries, Europe, US, this model was adapted and changed as the result of a process that was both top-down and bottom-up. But when it came to the colonies, this institution was implanted, not even grafted, as a strictly top-down project. We can draw certain generalizations from this historical overview. The modern African university is a colonial implant. There is no relationship between pre-modern institutions of higher learning in Africa, whether it be in Timbuktu, Morocco, Egypt, there's no relationship between them and the universities that exist today. The universities that exist today have been modeled on the colonial model. Even in Egypt, the most venerable religious institutions were redesigned according to this 19th century. The university was a key institution in colonial modernism, a central part of the civilizing mission. The mission of the modern university was to disseminate universal knowledge, and universal knowledge made no compromise to time or place. It stood for standards. It claimed to be a center of excellence, a global center, 
It was the first institution dedicated to the idea that one science fits all. It was the mandate to create cadres. Its mandate was to create cadres who would faithfully discharge this mission. It was the secular counterpart of the church. University graduates would be like catechists trained by the church, except that they would be secular missionaries of the state. They were meant to function without reservation and without remorse as the native vanguard of a global civilization. Now the first challenge to this notion of the university as an institution charged with a universal civilizing mission came from the nationalist movement. That challenge broadened the mandate of the university from both just excellence to include relevance. This shift underlined the significance of the University of Dar es Salaam from the mid-60s to the mid-80s. The turning point of Dar was the student demonstration in October 1966, protesting the introduction of national service by the government. Nerele called the students to State House. All 334 of them withdrew their scholarships and sent them home. The next year, he proclaimed the Arusha Declaration, a clarion call for socialism, and nationalized key sectors of the economy. The university called a conference in March 1967 on the role of the university in a socialist Tanzania, calling into question the relevance of the existing curriculum. The conference recommended continuous curriculum review. The core recommendation considered interdisciplinarity. The academic staff divided into three. One side called for a continuation of the existing discipline-based system. And the other side demanded an abolition of all discipline-based departments and their replacement by a single interdisciplinary education. A middle group wanted the departments to remain, but called for the introduction of an interdisciplinary core <coughs> to supplement a disciplinary focus. The University Council supported this middle course. Instead, the object should be to produce reasoning graduates, not just those dedicated to problem solving. My first full-time academic job was at the University of Dar es Salaam. I was hired to teach the interdisciplinary core to first-year students. This was a year-long double course called East African Society and Environment, taught to all students in the arts and social sciences. The process at Dar was not limited to formal structures of the university. There was strong student involvement outside the classroom, starting with the ideological class, or something which was called an ideological class, that was held every Sunday morning as an alternative to Sunday morning church services. There was also a proliferation of study groups. I remember being a member of six different study groups at a time each meeting once a week, and each on a different subject. Das Kapital, the Three Internationals, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Agrarian Question, and so on. Each group had four to eight members. Then there were student magazines. Cheche, which means in Kiswani, spark, from Lenin, spark. Cheche, and when Cheche was banned by the government, Mani Mani which took its name from the great resistance against German colonialism. On the other side of the border was Makere. Makere remained the hallmark of colonial education, seeing itself as the keeper of excellence. That claim was upheld by Ali Mazzouli, who defined an intellectual as a person fascinated by ideas. To those of us at Dar, this smacked of an indulgent individualism, totally devoid of social and political commitment. But the pressures for innovation and change were strong at Makerere too, except that these developed outside the formal confines of the university. The most important and consequential was the founding of a magazine called Transition in 1961, the year before the country's independence and indeed the year the University of Dar es Salaam was founded. 
Many of you may be familiar with Transition in Exile, now based at Harvard, which is more of a potted plant in a greenhouse. Transition at home in Kampala led to weather, rain, fire, and storm. From the outset, transition crossed boundaries. Stylistically, it reached beyond the gown to the town. No article was more than five pages. It also reached out beyond the local to global Africa. The editor was a Uganda nation of Bengali origin, Rajat Nyogi. The contributors included writers like Gugi, Shoinka, Achebe, Gordimon, Mbashlele, James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Paul Thoreau, academics like Mazuri, and nationalist politicians like Nyerere, Mboya, Kaunya. Ironically, transition made the university scholarship more relevant to town than anything produced at Al Islam. The content of transition was literary and political. The articles included strong critiques of the Constitution introduced in the aftermath of the 1966 crisis for undermining individual and political liberties. Some of the articles, like Farouz, Tarzan was the first expatriate, and Ali Mazruiz, Tanzafilia, and Nkrumah, the Lenin's son, achieved legendary controversial status. Each stirred controversy which multiplied when the fact that transition had received funding from Paris-based Council for Cultural Freedom, a secret CIA conduit, when this fact became public knowledge. The Obote government used this fact to close the magazine and imprison its editor, Rajat Nyogi, along with the writer in question, the writer of the story about the constitution, the new constitution, the writer in question being Abu Mayad. Both the scholarly and the political debates of that period focused on the question of radical nationalism. The discussion focused on the inner and the outer dimensions of militant nationalism. A key work underlining the larger global significance of militant nationalism was Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Radical nationalists contended that whereas colonialism had ended, imperialism had not. Militant nationalism was a response to the demands of a continuing struggle. The critique of militant nationalism focused on its in inner dimension. It came from both the left and liberal circles. The left critique was formulated by Isa Shilji in two books, The Silent Class Struggle and, the class, and class Struggles in Tanzania. Questioning Nyerere's claim that the country was building socialism, Shilji argued that nationalization had actually led to the development of a new type of bourgeoisie, one that had privatized public enterprises, or treated public enterprises as private property. He called it a bureaucratic bourgeoisie. The liberal critique came from Ali Mazuri, and for a while from Abu Mayanjali in transition. The focus was more political. Militant nationalism had appropriated the mantle of the nation and stifled democratic freedoms. Mazuri called on intellectuals to strive for autonomy from the new African state and its nationalist rulers. In the debate between Rodney and Mazuri, we at Dar es Salaam lined up behind Rodney and dismissed Mazuri as some kind of a gadfly. Of course, Rodney was right. Place matters. Scholarship needs to be anchored in time and place. Universities cannot just be centers of excellence. In that case, they may as well be on the moon, which is why they must also be centers of relevance. But today, in retrospect, I think there was more to the debate than we realized. The debate between excellence and relevance was not just an ideological debate. It was about the definition of an intellectual in our times. Mazui and Rodney represented two faces of the intellectual, the universal scholar and the public intellectual. We will do well to cast the debate in a broader historical frame. Mazui's response to Rodney's call for ideological commitment was contained in his article published in Transition. The article was called Tanzafilia. 
Mazui defined Tanzaphilia as an opium of Afrofighters. Nerele's Tanzania, he said, had cast a romantic spell over the left. Its effect was particularly marked amongst Western intellectuals who were complicit in the drift to one-party rule. Many of the most prosaic Western pragmatists, wrote Mazui, have been known to acquire a dreamy look under the spell of Tanzania. Mazui cast a worried eye on the radicals of Dar, but he singled out Colin Leeds, who had in 1961-62 been principal of Kirukoni College, an ideological school in the mode of Ruskin College, also in Dar Islam, established by Joan Wicken, a graduate of Ruskin College, but she also happened to be Nyerere's private secretary. Lees had lamented that besides the three obvious social ills, poverty, ignorance, and disease, Tanzania was also suffering from a fourth, empiricism. Mazuri was alarmed by the possibility that Dar too would become an ideological college as a result of pressure from a superman. Responding to figures like Lees, and presumably to the entire string of left intellectuals at Dar, including Rodney, Shilji, Namudere, and maybe even I myself, for whom Mazrui thought ideological orientation was everything. In this article, going back to Tanzania, he invoked a deeper epistemological reality, which he called mode of reasoning. Ideological orientation, Mazrui argued, is superficial and malleable. Quote, under a strong impulse, one can change one's creed, but it's much more difficult to change the process of reasoning which one acquires from one's total educational background. He gave the following example. French Marxists are still French in their intellectual style. Ideologically, they may have a lot in common with communist Chinese or communist North Koreans, but in style of reasoning and the idiom of his thought, a French Marxist has more in common with a French liberal than with fellow communists in China and Korea. And that is why a French intellectual who is a Marxist can more easily cease to be a Marxist than he can cease to be a French intellectual. <laughs> Both formulations, ideological orientation and mode of reasoning, appear in his essay in Transition, which came out in 1967. And if they evoke the work of Foucault, it is surely because the two were thinking along similar lines about discursive formations. Archaeology of Knowledge was published two years after Tanzafi, in 1969. Maybe somebody would want to find out whether Foucault read Tanzafi. That's a joke. <laughs> Obviously he did. <laughs> I wrote of this some few months ago in London Review of Books. In a letter to the editor, Colin Lee's objected that I had obscured the Cold War context that lent legitimacy to radical nationalism. But my purpose was not to return to the parameters of the early debate. The left highlighting the danger of imperialism on the outside and liberals pointing to the undermining of democracy on the inside. The purpose, rather, was to point to the need to sublate this discussion in which neither side Neither the left nor the liberals had offered a satisfactory response to the challenge of the times. The universal scholar and public intellectual are not two different persona. Rather than see them as alternatives between which we need to choose, it makes more sense to see these as two sides of the vocation of an intellectual who needs to be involved simultaneously in a twofold conversation a global conversation with a community of scholars, and a local conversation with society and the state. Another source of inspiration for the postdoctoral program at Miser was Codestria. Codestria, a Council for the Development of Social Research in Africa, was established in 1973. Its first director was Samir Amin. Samir died a few weeks ago. There has been an ongoing discussion of his life and work in Kodesia circles. But none so far as I can see at ASA. 
The reason I think points to an important difference between ASA and Conesri. I will offer a few thoughts on this. Since I've been an active member of Codestria since 1975, and since Codestria was an important influence on Misa, I would like to say a few words in appreciation of its founder, Samir Amin. I will confine myself to his intellectual work. Samir's doctoral thesis, The Multi-Volume Accumulation on the World Scale, was written on a vast canvas. It presented an ambitious outline agenda one that Samir spent a lifetime filling and fulfilling. Samir was hugely prolific. Among his writings, there were two which came closest to taking up the challenge formulated in his doctoral thesis. The first was Eurocentrism. The second was unequal development. I have taught Eurocentrism at least 10 times over the past two decades. Every time I read it, I'm amazed at the world historical grasp that informed its author. Samir was more a man of history than a man we could identify with a particular place. The places that most come to mind are Cairo, Dakar, and Paris. Even if Samir moved between them, he was a moving target, a man of no fixed abode. His life resembled that of Marx, a man without a homeland, but one whose home was a chosen commitment to a historical project. Like Marx, Samir was a man of a fixed time, the modern. I remember being struck by Samir's critique of Edward Said's politically important work, Orientalism. Samir objected to what he considered a trans-historical critique. He argued that rather than present us with an ahistorical discourse on Western culture, as if it were timeless, Edward should have given us a critique of the modern Western discourse on the Orient. I believe that Samir was the first to formulate this critique, which has since been repeated over and again by many others, including Ejaz Ahmed. Even though he thought his own work, his own writing, he thought of his own writing as grounded in Marxism, Samir is best known for his works on dependency theory. He introduced an entire generation of young scholars, myself included, to think of underdevelopment in historical terms. The work I found most truly compelling was Unequal Development and its companion volume, De Connection. De Connection. One gave a historical account of the present, the other charted a way forward. As Marx never tired of repeating, the test of theory lies in practice. I recall Samir telling us of when he received a call from Thomas Ankara asking him to travel urgently to Burkina Faso to discuss the challenge. On arrival, Samir was told by Sankara, you have told us that we must have the courage to deconnect. Well, before we could gather that courage, the French have taken the lead and deconnected us. <laughs> what shall we do? Samir was plummets. He admitted to us, I had not imagined that the question of deconnection would arise, would first arise in a country as poor as Burkina Faso. It seemed to illustrate a practical dilemma. Whereas prescriptive formulas, one size fits all, as short and succinct as deconnection, seem to apply to one and all without discrimination or difference. Each case is in practice different. And so are the consequences of the application different for each case. It seemed to raise a problem similar to that faced by the Russian Revolution. How was one to achieve socialism in a single country? In this case, the connection of a single country. I thought the story pointed to a broader issue. The objective claims of structuralism appear less convincing when bathed in a historical perspective. Historical specificity begins to distinguish one case from another. Although I had never had the opportunity to discuss this with Samir, I felt the history of the past few decades raised a central question for dependency theory and its conclusion that there can be no development in the context of an imperialist dominated world. What does the emergence of China as the new economic challenge to the only superpower, the US, 
say about our claims of dependency theory? And what about the emergence of others, such as India and Brazil, all with a colonial past and without a socialist present? The debate over Codesphere's overwhelming theoretical orientation to political economy and policy preference for a state-led growth model came to a head at the 1984 General Assembly. It led to the initiation of a new multinational research group on social movements and democracy, which was led by Wamba Diawamba and myself. Sami walked on two legs, to use a Maoist phrase constantly moving from theory to practice and back. The political economist in him was constantly put to task by his continuing engagement in real life politics. I thought his most difficult moment came with the Arab Spring in Egypt. We disagreed, we disagreed on political Islam several times. The first was decades ago at the Kodesfia working group on the gender question. I recall Samir being firmly and totally opposed to political Islam of every hue. He gave his reasons. He said political Islam was socially regressive on the gender question, and its laissez-faire economic thought went no further than philanthropy. The debate resurfaced at the 1991 Symposium on Academic Freedom in Kampala, except this time as a debate on democracy. How were we to think of the past century of state-enforced secularism against the reality of ethnic and religious mobilizations in society? Top-down secularism, bottom-up ethnic and religious mobilization. Samir was single-minded, a man with conviction, focus, and determination. He wanted clear sight of the enemy and a clear choice between alternatives. But the Arab Spring gave no such easy alternatives. The alternative it did pose was between a military-led secularism and a Muslim Brothers-led parliamentary democracy. The single-minded pursuit of secularism led to a military coup. The debate, which had been rife in Cordesia for over a quarter century, flared up once again at the last General Assembly, three years ago. Political Islam is today divided between two major tendencies. Both are socially reactionary and economically free market oriented. The difference between them is political. One tendency, illustrated by Daesh and Al-Qaeda, and supported by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, with the U.S. fully complicit, calls for a top-down armed struggle. The other champions a parliamentary role. More of a bottom-up approach, it reflects the actual historical experience of Turkey and Iran. The stakes are becoming clearer as global consequences of the Saudi-led Wahhabi mobilization against Muslim brothers becomes evident. Samir was a thinker and a public intellectual. This founding father of Kodesfia was determined that it must not become just another donor-funded collection of individual or small team researchers, indulgently watered like so many potted plants in greenhouses. Kodesfia, he was convinced, must remain open to sound and fury, wind and rain, storm and lightning. It must, above all, provide a home to discuss issues central to the future of African people. In the absence of a real African parliament, it must function like one. In contrast, ASA is a professional organization, devoted above all to building careers and monitoring the terrain known as African studies in the US. As the home of public intellectuals in Africa, and as a scholarly forum, Cordesphere does not limit its discussion to Africa. At a Cordesphere General Assembly, no part of the full world is forbidden territory. Rather than focus on a place called Africa, the debate is thematically and issue-driven, drawing on experiences from around the world. One last word about Samir Amin. Samir came of intellectual age during an era when the battle for independence, when the battle was for independence. It was a time, we underst it was a time when we understood independence in terms of so state sovereignty and decolonization of the economy. 
But success along this road has posed new challenges. Central among them is that of extreme violence. It calls on us to think of the other side of state sovereignty, but without letting go of the gains of independence. This challenge calls on us to broaden and deepen our understanding of political modernity and to critically think the notion of sovereignty at the heart of it if we are to develop a richer and deeper understanding of decolonization. We drew several lessons from the experiences I've just recounted in Bear Anklands. The first was that we had no choice but to develop a homegrown doctoral program. It would be the only way to move beyond the assumption that it's so far driven higher education, that theory is produced elsewhere and applied at home. This assumption has served to reify theory, whereby students assume that theory is not only produced elsewhere, but it is learned from the books like a set of formulas. The result is young people are glued to a set of texts whether Marx, Foucault, Weber, Francis Fukuyama, whoever else, as if these are sacrosanct. Second, we were determined to move beyond the confines of area studies, but without losing our rootedness. <coughs> Students were required to have a research competence in two languages, other than the language of instruction, which was English, which is English. Initially, we even required that a student identify a key scholarly text in English and translate it into one of his languages or her languages of competence. But the task proved arduous and we gave it up as a requirement. Refusing to be confined to an area like so many convicts, we said our ambition was to understand the world from Africa. Our vantage point our location was Africa, but our reach, unlimited. Third, we introduced an interdisciplinary core, a set of courses on method, theory, and history, which every student had to take. But we combined interdisciplinarity with a disciplinary leader. This, that's our ambition. Students were, in addition, required to declare a major and a minor in one of four disciplinary fields, political studies, historical studies, cultural studies, and political economy. Finally, we were committed to move beyond the binaries we, we had inherited, between excellence and relevance, or the scholar and the public intellectual. Each was one side of a single quest. The question arose when we had to decide on the subject on which students would be required to take comprehensive exams in their third year. What should these be? If they were to take two comprehensives, what would these be on? We finally decided that one comprehensive would be thematic and the other would be place specific. For the thematic exam, the student would define a theme, say the land question or political violence, and then proceed to identify key debates, authors and texts that have shaped the literature on the theme globally over different periods. For the second comprehensive exam, the student would identify a place, say Tanzania, and define the multiple themes, and for each theme, the authors and texts, that have driven the scholarship on this particular place. Our final source of learning was by a negative example. That was the World Bank's assault on African higher education, which began at Makerere and then moved to Dar es Salaam and other places. At both places, the World Bank had faced remarkably little resistance, and we wondered why. In spite of their differences, there was one commonality between Dar and Makere. The post-independence renaissance in both places were more, was more political and ideological than academic and scholarly. It had been part of the great nationalist upset. But the nationalist upsurge did not last long when the nationalists in power and dissidents in universities went their separate ways. The repression was not long in coming. Academics responded in different ways. Some, myself included, spread our wings and crossed oceans to work in the global academy. 
Those who stayed at home were embraced by donor institutions, courted to become relevant in a different way as consultants to governments and even to donors to enable, to make possible evidence-based policy making. That's the threat. Why had we succumbed so easily to the World Bank's assault? Partly because our academic endeavor had lacked institutional depth. In my six years at DAR in the 1970s and nearly 15 years at Makere in the 80s and 90s, I cannot recall a single discussion on the need to develop a doctoral program. Had we developed viable, had we developed viable doctoral programs, we would not have seeded the ground on research that easily. The unquestioned assumption was that doctoral training would take place overseas. This is why research at both institutions came to be identified with individual scholars and diminished as and when these scholars migrated or left the institution in question. This is what happened at Dar with the departure of the generation in the 70s. There was also a second lesson. The university was in society, but not yet quite of it. When academics got involved off campus, it was out of individual need to earn extra money or to strive for government favors or government services. When it came to oppositional individuals, the political agenda was limited to regime change. We had little to offer those outside campus by way of alternative concepts, alternative perspectives, alternative intellectual orientations, and indeed alternative social processes. We only had an alternative political process. The magazine transition turned out to be a solitary and short lived endeavor. That challenge remains. Thank you. Mabdani. Professor Mabdani has agreed to take a few questions. We are meant to start the award ceremony in about 30 minutes. We'll spend between 10 and 15 minutes with questions. If you would like to ask a question, please would you pick up your hand. Uh, there will be a microphone circulating. So we keep the questions compact and uh, ending.